A graph is a collection of vertices with edges between them. The point of studying graphs is that there are lots and lots of problems in computer science that are basically about entities of one sort or another and connections between them. In this part of the course, we're going to study a range of graph algorithms, starting with algorithms for finding paths in a graph. But before going on to the algorithms, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about the types of problems we can represent using graphs. We'll start off with the first graph problem of them all, the bridges of Königsberg. This problem dates from 1735, from the city that was then called Königsberg and is now called Kaliningrad. The city has a river running through it and it has seven picturesque bridges. Leonard Euler, a mathematician who lived in Königsberg, was asked the question, can I go for a stroll around the city on a route that crosses each bridge exactly once? He was intrigued. He said, this question is so banal, but nothing in mathematics, neither geometry nor algebra, nor even the art of counting is sufficient to solve it. That's what mathematicians love best, simple questions that push us into new ways of thinking. And that's what Euler did. He realized it doesn't matter what exact streets you walk along. All that matters is which of these four land masses you're on, A, B, C, or D, and how you get between them. We can forget about the map completely and think purely about this thing here, this set of four vertices and seven edges, and turn the original question, can I go for a stroll that crosses each bridge exactly once? into what we would now call a discrete maths question about a graph, which has a fairly simple solution based on counting vertices along a path, which you can read about in the lecture notes that go with this course. OK, so that's the birth of graph theory. Let's just look at a modern take on Euler's graph, navigation on a game map. We have a game map here and a computer controlled agent at the top right who wants to find a way to the jetty. The first thing to do is to simplify the obstacles so that they're just polygon outlines. Next, divide the entire map area into convex polygons. We could, for example, find a triangulation, in other words, split the area up into a mesh of triangles, or we could use larger polygons like I'm showing here. There are all sorts of interesting algorithmic problems about geometry and triangulations and so on, and we'll touch on some of them at the end of the course. But for now, we'll concentrate only on the pathfinding part. So, the next step is to create a graph. One vertex for every polygon of free space and edges to show which polygons share a common edge. Any path in this graph, that is any sequence of vertices joined by edges, can be turned into a track for our agent to follow. The map doesn't matter at all. All that matters is this graph. Everything up to this point would probably have computed in advance, perhaps when creating the map. And the only thing we need to compute while actually running the game is finding the path on this graph. In the next few videos, we'll look at a whole range of algorithms for finding paths in graphs. OK, now let's look at a graph that represents a very different type of space, the Facebook social graph. Here's an example from a Facebook engineering blog post. Alice was at the Golden Gate Bridge with Bob. Kathy comments, wish we were there. David likes this. And now let's look at how it's all represented inside Facebook's graph database. The first bit of the graph is straightforward. There are four people here with some friendship relationships between them. So let's have a graph with four vertices and the appropriate edges. I think that in real life, a friendship has to be a reciprocal relationship as opposed to love, which is allowed to be one way. But anyway, Facebook has decided to represent a friendship link as a pair of directed edges in their graph. And there's a vertex also for the location, the Golden Gate Bridge. So. How should we represent the relationship between Alice and Bob and the bridge? Facebook decided to represent it by a vertex, a check-in vertex. This vertex represents an instance of being in a place. This being in a place thing has an instigator, Alice, and it involves a location and it involves other users like Bob that Alice has ta tagged. And finally, the comment, which is linked to Kathy, the commentator, 
and to the check-in vertex that she's commenting on, and also to David who liked the comment. Here's a question. Why do you think Facebook decided to make check-in be a vertex rather than a link between a user and a location? Go on, pause the video and stop and have a think. I'd say the reason is that Facebook wants to attach comments to check-ins, like Cathy's comment here. The basic rule of graphs is that edges are only allowed to connect vertices to vertices, so if check-in were an edge, we wouldn't be allowed to attach comments to it. You might ask, why not just define a new type of graph, one that allows edges between vertices and other edges? Well, we could, but it's not a good idea because there's lots of clever maths and clever algorithms that people have found for working with regular graphs, and we don't want to have to reinvent it all. Much better to adapt your data model to make it into a conventional graph, and then you can benefit from all the clever stuff that's out there, like fast library routines and help on Stack Overflow. Now, one more example of a graph. Here's a snippet from the OpenStreetMap graph showing the centre of Cambridge. OpenStreetMap, in case you haven't come across it, is sort of like the Wikipedia equivalent of Google Maps, where anyone can contribute, and it's especially good, I find, for walks and paths and recreation. Now, in this OpenStreetMap graph, vertices represent physical locations in the real world, and all the roads and so on are made up of edges, and the edges are all drawn as straight lines between vertices. So, if we want to draw a nice smooth curved road, we have to have lots of vertices and edges. And the more vertices and edges there are in a graph, the more space it takes to store the data, and the slower it will be to run algorithms. That's going to be one of our main concerns in this course. What's the running time complexity of our graph algorithms as a function of the number of vertices and edges in the graph? We'll get into some very sophisticated thinking about advanced data structures for speeding up these algorithms. OK, that's all been some general introduction about what we want graphs for and what sort of problems we'd like to solve with them. The next few videos are going to concentrate on algorithms for finding paths in a graph. But before we can get onto the algorithms, though, we ought to start with some basic notation and some definitions. A graph consists of a set of vertices, which we'll call V, and a set of edges, which we'll call E. There are two types of graphs we're going to be looking at. There are directed graphs, in which each edge goes from one vertex to another, and there are undirected graphs, in which each edge links two vertices but with no directionality. When I'm writing down a line of notation, I'll write the directed graph edges as arrows, and I'll write the undirected graph edges with double-headed arrows. Sometimes you also see them written as plain dashes. A lot of the algorithms we're going to be looking at in the next few videos can be applied to either type of graph, but there are some which are specific to one or the other. OK, now some terminology. Neighbours, paths and cycles. I'll let you read these to yourself. And then after you've read them, ask yourself, are these definitions properly stated? Are they precise enough to be definitions? Another big theme in this course will be rigorous analysis of algorithms to prove that our algorithms are correct. And so you should always be on the lookout for corner cases and precision. You can think of this as being mathematician style, always looking for rigor, or you can think of it as hacker style, always looking for loopholes and attack points. Okay, have a quick read of the definitions Think to yourself, are they rigorous? And when you're ready, press play again. This definition of path isn't actually all that great. Does a single vertex on its own constitute a path? The definition doesn't make it clear. Let's be a bit more precise. We'll say that a path is a sequence of two or more vertices connected by edges. We'll say it's allowed to visit vertices more than once and it's allowed to reuse edges. And what about a cycle? I'm going to stick in an extra restriction to say that a cycle is a path where the start and end vertices are identical, but where no other vertices are repeated. It's pretty arbitrary which way round we make these definitions. I could have defined a cycle to allow repeats, or I could have defined a path to disallow repeats. 
What matters is that I choose something precise and I stick with it and I don't change my definitions halfway through a proof. Okay, now a few more definitions for some special types of graphs we'll be coming across later. First, a directed acyclic graph, or DAG, is just what the name says it is. It's a directed graph without any cycles. They're used all over computer science, especially for representing computational dependencies. Just, just a quick comment. The definition says acyclic, but isn't there a cycle here? No, there isn't. Remember the definition we set out so precisely. A cycle has to have two or more vertices in sequence connected by edges. And because of the directionality of these edges, there's no way you can follow these edges round in a loop and end up back where you started. Next definition, a forest, which is defined to be an undirected acyclic graph, and a tree, which is defined to be a connected forest, and connected has its obvious meaning. This might seem like a perverse definition. Who in their right mind would define tree as connected forest? Someone who wants to be absolutely sure that they work from definitions and not from half-baked intuition, that's who. When we write out proofs, it's okay to start with hunches and instincts, but we have to finish up with something that comes directly from the letter of the definitions. Okay, quick quiz. Of these two graphs, which is a tree and which is a forest? Have a think. Trick question. They're both forests. And the right one is also a tree. Remember, follow strictly the letter of the definitions. Last thing I want to talk about in this video is how we'll store graphs in the computer. There are two standard choices. Here's the first, and I've illustrated it here for an undirected graph. We'll store a list of all of the vertices and associated with each vertex, we'll store a list of the vertices it's connected to. Or if you're a Python programmer, it's probably more natural to store this as a dictionary of lists. That way you can use an arbitrary ID to refer to vertices rather than being forced to use integer positions in an array. So this is called the adjacency list representation. The other standard representation is what's called an adjacency matrix a matrix with one row per vertex and one column per vertex, and the entries of the matrix say whether or not there's an edge between them. So if that's what you want to look up, if you want very fast lookup for a given pair of vertices, is there an edge between them? The adjacency matrix is obviously going to be faster than the adjacency list. Okay, let's do a bit of complexity analysis. How much space does it take to store the graph with each of these two representations? We don't want to get bogged down in details about exact number of bytes and so on. We just want to know how things scale for big graphs. So we'll use big O notation. The adjacency matrix takes big O of V squared because it stores a V by V matrix. And the adjacency list version takes big O of V plus E, big O of V to store the array of vertices and big O of E for all of the edges that are stored across all of the lists. Now, if we were being really fussy, we'd write big O of size of V plus size of E, because remember V and E are sets, and what we want here are their sizes. But no one ever writes it that way. Everyone understands that in big O notation, we mean the size of V and the size of E. Okay, we're ready to start looking at graph algorithms. But before we move on to the next video, here are just some quick questions to make sure you've got the definition straight. You can check your answers in the printed notes. And once you've checked them, head on to the next video.